Okay, I think we're going to best start. Um, hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening or this morning or wherever you are in the world. Uh, the TGFU SIG is incredibly happy to present and partner with St Mary's University Twickenham uh, to showcase the excellent work of the students and staff working in the field of game-based approaches. It gives me great pleasure to hand over to Maeve Merritt, who will introduce our speakers for this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ellen, and, and welcome everybody to our first webinar um, um, presented from St Mary's University in London. Um, we're very happy and privileged to have a very supportive partnership with the TGFU SIG and Ellen in particular. Just to give a bit of an overview of what tonight will entail, we have four presentations which are action packed and we have some of our students, our staff, graduates who are going to present our research and theory and practice in games based pedagogy. Um, after each presentation, there will be time for some questions, so please use the Q&A box which is monitored by our staff, um, which will allow our press presenters um, to answer as they finish their presentation. Please note that if there is any time at the end, um, and if we run out of time, we will address all questions um, at a later stage. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to present our first, um, our first presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce Jamie Parr. Jamie is a physical education student with our Physical Education Sport and Youth Development Programme, and he's also a teacher and practitioner um, from a large local secondary school in our partnership area in Twickenham. So, Jamie, whenever you're ready. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to start by just giving you a quick flavour of, of what this uh, short presentation uh, will explore uh, this evening. So we're going to look in detail at the pedagogical uh, approach that is game-centred approach, why it, what it is and why it's used. Uh, we're then going to look at the role of the coach and the teacher within that setting. Um, and then we're going to show a bit of a practical understanding, so link the theory with practical, uh, over what a session might look like and how we link the, the, the key concepts of the game-centred approach. And then finally, we'll feed forward and look at and hopefully touch on what other, other parts of the presentation may look at tonight. So first, what is the game-centred approach? Well, it's important to understand that it's an umbrella term for a number of different games pedagogies, such as TGFU and GameSense. Despite sitting under the same term, they all do vary in, in different ways. So, for example, TGFU is focused about teaching the game first before skill refinement, whereas GameSense focuses on creating thinking players. Back in 1984, Bunker and Thorpe, said that games could be used to develop students in a variety of ways. Teaching through a game-centered approach is student-centered according to Cushion, uh, who in 2013 uh, said that students are placed at the heart of the learning process. It's very much at odds with the traditional skill drill approach. Furthermore, students are the main decision makers and places emphasis on them to develop their problem-solving skills and teamwork skills. So very much that the practitioner is acting as that facilitator of learning. Another key component of the game's uh, centred approach is it focuses on the development of students' autonomy, enjoyment and perceived competence. So it seems obvious to say that you're more likely to enjoy uh, what you're learning, uh, more likely to learn what you're enjoying uh, when, you're, when you're being taught a way that you are, are, are enjoying. So recent research from Jalaris in 2020 shows that a unit taught through a game centred approach provides students with greater autonomy, enjoyment and perceived competence than an instruction based approach. So when teaching or coaching through a game sense approach, there are sort of six key pillars uh, that we must work to develop. Light and forms identify that activities should be taught through games based activity using skills that you would see in a competitive environment. So this will allow students to understand the objective of the game, they'll show that appreciation. These game based activities provide varying tactical problems uh, for students to solve as they experience success in the learning environment and they overcome the challenges, practitioners should feel focused on creating progressively more complex tactical problems for the, for, so the students are constantly uh, being challenged. Challenging students into high order thinking, so that comes through questioning, uh, gives them opportunities to make decisions of how things can be progressed or regressed. Light and form stress the importance of skill execution uh, during game-based activities. So if students are unable to complete basic skills, how can we expect them to, to apply them in game situations? So for example, if a student can't kick a ball, how are they going to be able to put that into a 4v2 situation? 
critics of game-based pedagogies often say that, that students don't know enough about games to be able to play them uh, before they learn the skills. However, Butler outlined if we can empower learners through modifications and, and ad adaptations in line with the age and stage of the learner, and then they can be successful. This can be done through the teacher acting as that facilitator and students actively learning. The final point is where the teachers and coaches act in partners, uh, and it requires a very hands-off approach uh, from the practitioners. So they're seen as partners in, in that learning process. As Harvey Etel found, best practice includes standing back and observing, so understanding when to intervene and question. But for those who haven't done this before, it can be quite a challenge to adjust. So why uh, a game-centred approach? Well, research heavily indicates that the traditional skill drill approach is failing and is outdated. Light et al. found that practitioners failed to recognise the holistic nature of games. So they were concerned with the physical development and often overlooked the role that cognition can play. Thus, there is significant pressure for students as early as in primary schools to be taught through games so they can learn skills and tactics required to be successful. In support of that, Casey et al. found that prior to the delivery of the game-centred unit, students were highly disengaged, un uncomfortable and de demotivated to participate in PE. Many students said they were only attending lessons because they had to, so one can only imagine the impact of this uh, on students' lifelong participation with, with physical activity. Her research in London-based schools found that once a game-centred approach was, was used, it heavily impacted students' attitude to physical education and they were more intrinsically motivated to succeed. PE had turned into a, a very more, much more fun, comfortable and inclusive environment for all. So now on to what, 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 good, uh, what a good teacher or coach looks like within the game-centred approach. So Light and Fawns identified questioning uh, as an integral, po integral part of best practice. Uh, where the coach step backs and provides students with open-ended questions and closed questions to think about when they can share their ideas. It's really important to give the students take-up time. This very much moves away from the traditional methods whereby the practitioner may spoon-feed uh, students and be very direct, uh, dominating that learning environment. So rather, through a game-centered approach, students are encouraged to think about the performance, the impact it had on the game, uh, and what they could change next time. So allowing that group discussion dictates the learning environment, forces students to interact with each other, again, developing their, their understanding of both individual and collective performance. This is supported by Jalarius, who carried out an outline that students feel empowered through the process of questioning to become critical thinkers. So this approach is also very much taught through a constructivist method. So as Ertner and Newby depicted, this is, this is where the student constructs the learning process rather than obtaining it. The students are very much fully active in, in the learning process and are responsible for that collaboration and also communicating with their peers to guide the learning environment. So it's important to, to match the theory uh, with the practical links of what I've discussed already. I'm going to briefly link the, the key concepts of the game sense approach to a lesson plan that I have taught. So students uh, are learning through uh, the principles of an invasion game, focused on the attacking principles of creating space. So the rules of football were adapted to suit the objectives of the, the session, thus showing that appreciation of the game of football. Uh, students developed their tactical awareness of creating space, so the how and why was developed through stopping the session at different points to discuss how the game was working. Continuous, well-thought and adaptable questions took place. These were planned in ahead during the session, so students were deciding not only how to progress the activities, but also to regress them. So the questions were dependent on their success. Students were empowered uh, by being the sole decision makers. Positive rewards such as verbal praise were offered to congratulate best practice and team discussions led to improved performance. Students had to be able to pass and dribble in order to be successful. And despite that not being an issue in my, in my particular lesson, if you did notice this was the case, you could add in conditions within this game uh, in order to maximise chances of that skill execution. So, for example, students um, who are struggling to dribble and keep hold of the ball cannot be tackled for five seconds, allowing them that time and space on the ball to make decisions. And finally, I plan thoroughly uh, in advance the questions to check students learning in line with the learning objectives. So questioning was critical uh, and our role as practitioners to, is to fo foster and facilitate that positive environment that allows students to be challenged. So to feed forward and look at what further research uh, may need to look like in this area, um, there is limited research on how the game centers approach is being used in primary schools. 
Um, so it would be good to have a look at uh, the impact um, with, with young children. Um, comparisons of game-based pedagogies, we said there's a real, it's a real umbrella term, there's plenty uh, of pedagogies there, so comparisons between uh, perhaps CGFU and GameSense, for example. And also we've spoken about the need for games to be used within a, a primary setting, so it's really important we understand how our, how our teachers are being trained, whether that's through PGC or SKIP programmes, so making sure that we understand how they're being taught and to facilitate uh, this games approach that is seems to be uh, taking over the world of, of PE. Thank you very much. Thank you, and Jamie, thank you so much um, for a really thought-provoking um, and interesting conversation. I'm going to hand over to Ellen, who is um, had a few questions from our attendees. Yes, thank you, Jamie. Um, it was an incredibly interesting presentation, so thank you for that. Um, we do have one question from uh, Jacob Law um, asking, what would you suggest to be a good starting approach for teachers looking to implement this game-centred approach? I think, I think it, 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 it's got to be confidence. Um, I think that as somebody who, who perhaps um, is taking on a new teaching approach, confidence is really good and understand that actually everything might not be successful to start with. Uh, we highlighted in that presentation the need to step back um, and, and try and understand that actually us being as practitioners, we don't always need to be involved and actually we can have more of an impact by stepping back, looking at what's going on before we intervene and really targeting those to that time for intervention. Um, so I would say confidence, be relaxed um, and yeah, be, be prepared for it to go wrong first time around. Thank you, Jamie. Are there any other questions for Jamie? Um, oh, I have sorry. one, thank you. I, I'm probably going to put you on the spot now, Jamie, as we're working really, really closely with this on that. Um, and as we know, as, as your background in, in working in a, in a very busy P department um, is in a teaching role, where do you see this making the, the biggest difference in that challenge and that, in that change within the pupils within the school. So obviously in a first-hand practitioner experience, where have you seen that really work for our children in schools? I think, I think the, the sort of the traditional skill drill approach involves a lot of students being quite stood around and not, and not active, whereas this games approach um, involves students constantly being active on their feet. And you see that engagement from them, that, that enjoyment level increase because they're on the move and they're constantly having to think about what they're doing. So I, I certainly feel like that, that games approach, um, it, you just see it more from the kids in terms of that enjoyment. I've noticed we've had quite a few questions come in as we're talking there. Uh, so we'll run through as many as we can here. Uh, from Stuart Curry. Um, Thank you, Jamie, for your presentation. How did you assess student learning in your lesson? So I think I think the questioning was was really important. Um, you know, ask asking them. Uh, well, in relation to cre the creation of space, how do we create space? Um, how did it change as we progressed through the activities and made made them more harder? You know, that less time and space on the ball. Um, you know, was, was probably probably a big factor. I think also giving them take up time, that opportunities for discussion before they feed back to the back to the practitioner um, was 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 really important. And I think just sort of building on that one by Noel Dempsey, what would some of the typical questions posed um, in the GBA? Um, so, for for me, I, I, I was always looking at. The how and the why questions um, so I would be looking at in, in relation to the lesson plan that I put up so how do you create space why would you want to create space what's the impact of doing that um, how did how did the the game uh, become more challenging for the attack when we increase the number of defenders um, you know if we increase increase the space that we have on the pitch what, what does that how does that impact our ability to create space if we decrease it how does it create so a lot a lot of them for me linked to how uh, and why and, and actually challenges the students to give those sort of longer answers and think about those longer answers rather than your sort of your very sort of uh, closed yes no questions um gonna go for another one I'm running out of time here <laughs> keep going um 
so are there any sort of sports or types of sports where this doesn't work or is more challenging that you've found? Um, I think I, th- I think it, it, it can be it can be adopted um, for, 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 for the majority of sports, but sort of the in- individual sports, I think, are slightly more challenging. Um, that being said, we did experience last year uh, a fantastic way of, of cooperative learning um, through dance and gymnastics. Um, I think invasion games are much easier to apply to apply the sort of the games approach in. But that being said, you know, if you put some some real thought into it, individual activities, there is a place for it within 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 games. There's just more questions keep coming in. Am I still okay to keep going, Miv? I think if you don't mind, if we can, Jamie can. Jamie, you're very popular this evening, as I knew you would be. Um, Jamie, please feel free, as you said, to take time to answer those, or we will answer them at the end. So we are able to, to type text those. Um, we'll just move on with our next presentation. Thank you so much, and thank you for the interest, and it's great to always have questions. So give me great pleasure to introduce our next, um, our next presentation, and it comes from uh, Laura Merkel. Laura Merkel is a student researcher um, and she has extensive experience and interest in a number of game sports. And something interesting about Laura, Laura joins us um, as uh, has been a student with us um, from Germany. So we're very interested to see Laura's under, understanding. Of Laura. So over to you, Laura. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Maeve. Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura, and I'm going to talk you through the digital video game design today, also referred to as the metacognitive approaches. Um, So we at this approach covered in level five as part of the games practice module. And it's caught my interest a little bit due to its modernness. So um, some of you might know this approach already, some might not. I didn't know it before. Um, so within finding more about this, finding out more about this approach, um, it was really interesting to see what development and potential is within this. Um, and I ultimately also decided to do my research project on it. So um, let's jump straight in. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview on the content that we're going to be covering. So. First, I'm going to just define metacognition for you, um, because to be honest, before we had this in the module, I did not know what metacognition meant. So uh, because it's the foundation of the approach, I'm just going to go into that quickly. Then I'm going to look at the most important uh, digital video game design key theories and how how it's evolved over time. Then we're going to look at what theoretical research is in place already, what empirical research is there, and finally what gaps um, I've identified through an extensive literature review, um, which then led to my research aims and my research question. And ultimately, I've put together a research project plan, which I'm going to be briefly going over because in the next few weeks, it's going to be involving massively. So... Yeah, let's go straight in. We have, first of all, just a quick definition of what metacognition is. So it technically means thinking about thinking. So reflecting and understanding of um, on and off your own thought processes, um, especially within learning. And Madhavi ultimately uh, defined it as knowing how to learn, um, which makes it obviously very relevant for schools and any sort of learning environment Um, and its relevance to PE is that it includes transferable skills such as decision making, problem solving or risk taking which obviously in games um, is essential and very very important to develop. Next up we are going to look at some key theories. Um, So there are very Um, important key features that I'm going to be mentioning just to give you an understanding of what the approach is made of. Um, Jim G in 2017 actually 77 sorry actually built that bridge from um, between video games and how the features of it can be beneficial to learning 
Um, and those key features also refer to as smart rules. Um, they are in place to enhance progression, uh, differentiation and feedback. So uh, the first one will be what's the mission, which is basically a replacement for what will we learn today? So at the beginning of the lesson, teacher goes, right, this is what we're going to learn today. Um, but instead, the teacher is going to say, right, what's our mission today? And I'm going to go through it. Um, there is a pause button within the game that students can use um, and actually then go to the teacher, ask for advice, for example, ask for a challenge. So the, the students are very much empowered in this and the teacher is actually supposed to step back quite a bit. Um, there is a superpower to be earned or multiple superpowers. Um, they can be put in place if students are succeeding in something, doing very well, or they can also be handed over to a team who is struggling and the teacher thinks, okay, they might do better with just that little extra help. So for example, eliminating a player from the other team temporarily. Um, the whole approach is made up of levels. So um, the different levels are basically just representing their stage of progress um, and they can go up in levels, but they cannot go down. Um, so through retrying to level up, they're going to sort of just keep improving. And then at the end of the day, the end of the lesson, they are able to save their progress. Um, and then if they come back next week, they're not, they haven't lost or what they've worked for last week, they can just keep going where they've left off. Um, and yeah, the whole sense of teaching a DVGD lesson is basically putting rules in place. So the teacher is pretty much a playmaker in a sense, and the students are the players, and the players are supposed to figure out how to use the rules of the game to play to their advantage and then achieve a win state. Um, yeah, and then Moston and Ashworth, they have said in 2007 as well that the approach would be a great addition to the so-called teachers and coaches toolbox. And that just refers to a teachers or coaches back pocket, basically full of approaches such as TGFU, et cetera, they can pull out whatever, depending on whatever they want to focus on. And if they would like to focus on metacognitive skills, this approach would be obviously very beneficial in focusing on that anyway. Um, Perry, Lundy and Golder in 2019, they've done a very extensive literature review of metacognitive skills in general in school settings, and they have an ad identified a neglect of them in PE, um, which makes this approach even more relevant um, to look at and do some more research on. And um, finally, Price, Collins, Duskowski and Peel in 2017 have also highlighted that there is a lack of research and specification on how these metacognitive skills can be developed in popular approaches such as TGFU and game sense so it doesn't mean that there is no development there it just needs to be a bit more researched let's move on so all these oh, one second sorry <laughs> there we go skip the slide there um so now we're going to move on to the case for the importance of my research project and um, what i've done is i've divided this into what theoretical research is already existing what empirical research is there? And then from that, I have then identified the gaps in research. Um, so theoretical research very much says that there is a big necessity for this approach to be tried out, research put in place because of that neglect of metacognition in PE. And because it develops those transferable skills, there is a big importance there. Um, and theory also very detailed lines out um, how to ideally teach this approach with all the key features um, and all, all its structure, very, very detailed. However, the empirical research has found um, implication and quite a lot of implications in practice, um, which are determined by multiple, multiple factors, such as age group of of the students, um, sports conditions. Um, so yeah, 
they have that was um price and pill they've done a very very detailed piece on that and that will definitely play into my research as well um it's however has been shown that the dbgd approach successfully develops metacognitive skills um so it can for sure be in coaches and teachers toolboxes to be tried out um and then finally the gap in research is actually which is most interesting fact for us all um what does the teacher do so what is the pedagogical point of view because theory theory very much says that the teacher is is supposed to be stepping back um nearly the whole time unless students take the opportunity and pause um pause the game and then look for advice etc um but um, what I've asked myself then, what if there if there's a situation where the teacher observes um, that the students could need a clue or some help? Um, yeah, how do you then handle that situation? So that is very much my research aim number one. How is the pedagogical point of view, and how does the teacher act as a playmaker? And with what kind of influence? Um, secondly, there is very big focus on the cognitive side of things but as we all know um PE should be about the holistic development of the child so I've asked myself but what about the technical and the physical skills because there is very little mentioning of those in theory how how they can be assessed and obviously we have this assessment for learning through the constant feedback um but there just wasn't much detail on that. So I'm very interested to see how we can find, uh, we can assess those. And lastly, um, there is very, very limited age group research. So the only um, empirical research that I found, they have done their research on um, under 17s, adolescent soccer players, female. And um what I'm interested to know, because I do want to go to primary school um, and below, um, how does that then work for young age groups in key stage one or two? And how can we modify it for those age groups? Right, moving on to the next. So this is my final research question that I've come up with. So investigating the practical application of theory, teaching, DVGD or metacognitive approaches. And these are my research aims, but I have pretty much just um, explained them. So feel free to have a little read through, um, but we'll be moving on to the research project plan, which is um, very much evolving over the next few weeks. Um, but the plan is to base this research on an interpretivist paradigm in form of qualitative, um, especially action research, and previous literature has based their empirical research of this approach in a format called coach as researcher, um, which was in a coaching environment. So I'm going to I've changed it to teacher as researcher because I do want to um, explore the school settings. Um, and then it's going to be a collaborative concept. So there's going to be an author one, um, which would be me teaching the lessons and planning the lessons and then also two, um, which is um, a supervisor, a games based pedagogy um, expert who just has that extra bird's eye perspective on how we can mold theory and practice together. Um, it, as I'm currently working in an infant school setting, I'm going to teach, try and teach this approach to year two. So key stage one and try and simplify as much as possible by teaching those PE lesson plans to them based on DVGD and then finally collect data through voice recordings immediately after and reflection documents. So then it might be that throughout the weeks that I'm teaching them, the lesson plans evolve lots and um, there'll be very interesting findings. So um, yeah, very, very exciting to see where this approach will take me, um, very modern. So yeah, obviously, if you do have any questions, please do let me know and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for a very extensive presentation and the detail of what's really exciting sometimes is, is what's on the cusp of, of the research and, and, and where your interests lie. 
So I'll hand over to Ellen. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, excellent presentation. I have a few questions and then a few people have made some nice comments. So I think I'm going to leave the comments for Laura to look at and answer back to you. Um, but I will ask the questions that I've spotted everybody. So Noel Dempsey has said, great presentation. What would be the main benefit of approaching teaching or learning in this way from a practical perspective? So I would definitely say it's it's, of course, the development of skill, those transferable skills, decision making, problem solving, risk taking, etc. Um, but I also think it's it's an approach that is very modern um, and it can be a very valuable addition to any teacher's knowledge to pull out if you would like to focus on those metacognitive skills. Um, I, what sort of drew me to the approach in the first place as well is video games is very relevant for for ch children and and young adolescents nowadays so it might actually be that it's it's very interesting for them to mold that together and they maybe it might spike participation rates as well um so yeah it, it needs a lot of research still um so in, it's in its early stages but I definitely think that there's lots of lots of potential there if modified correctly in practice and adjusted to the needs of the students because at the end of the day you know your students and you then modify the approach so it suits them so it's I think it's very individual but there's lots of benefits hopefully yeah. thank you Laura um, another sort of question um, a comment hi Laura great presentation on an interesting approach to take did you find any research about this approach applied to varied fields such as special educational needs and disabilities? Or if not, do you think there's future opportunities available? So um, unfortunately, I didn't find any um, any research on SEND environments. Um, yeah, there is very little empirical a research even in sports it seems to be predominantly soccer as well football sorry um but as I said I'm going to do it in my infant school that I'm working at and they are actually an inclusive school so that will definitely be another section in my research how that has worked out for them um in a mainstream school um with obviously in, in, that is inclusive so that will be very interesting to see um, how that works out and how how that can be modified and um, we're lucky enough to have quite a few teaching assistants as well that I can then chat to and um, see what they think works best for them but hopefully there will be lots of research coming through and um, yeah hoping to sort of get the ball rolling there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is a comment from Del Godfrey Shaw. Um, I'm going to leave that one, Del, uh, for Laura to uh, read and look at and comment back uh, for you as we move on through this rest of this presentation. Um, so thank you for that, Laura. Um, I'm going to hand over back to Maeve. Thank you very much. Um, so next to our, our third presentation in this webinar um, for this evening. So if you've made it this far, hopefully you'll stay a little bit longer because I'm very excited to present our next um, piece, piece of research. Um, Kenzie Wernley, Wernley is our PE teacher and actual graduate from our degree programmes at St Mary's. Um, her presentation really focuses on her action um, research and coaching in Nepal. And her research in particular is under review for publication. So we're very um, keen for Kenzie to share her knowledge with us this evening. So Kenzie, whenever you're ready. Um, the research that I completed was um, looking at slightly away from what um, the other two people have spoken about already today. It was looking at um, adult netball coaching and how COVID impacted the way coaches approach sessions and what would happen moving forward for those sessions as well. Um, the current research landscape suggested that there was limited knowledge and understanding into the coaching methods, especially at participation level. I found that a lot there was a lot of elite research, but not a lot on sort of grassroots and participation level. Um, so by completing the dissertation, it gave me the um, better understanding of the methods that coaches used for adult teams. 
um, and the effect that the COVID pandemic had on the way coaches approached certain sessions. Um, I did this by doing interviews. I interviewed six different coaches and it was across England and as well in Wales and Northern Ireland as well. Um, but going back to the research, so um, again, looking at based on what this webinar is a game centered approach, which is mainly used worldwide in a lot of different sporting um, environments. Uh, game centered approach mainly centers around the use of small modified games for people to develop their uh, game like skills. Um, the research has shown that it helps develop players technique ability to make space and their tactical understanding, which to me as a netball player is really, really important in a game of netball. Um, therefore, a game sense approach means that coaches allow their players to deepen their perspective and understanding of the game to be able to construct their own meaning. And I think this is important because not just talking about people in school, but adults learn differently as well. So you want to make sure that they're able to construct their own meaning and develop their own understanding. Uh, during a session where game sent approach is facilitated, the coach would use a technique of questioning and constructive praise. And although I looked at adults, this was a really common theme of questioning and constructive praise, even with adults, and it helped them learn a lot more throughout the sessions. Um, coaching approaches differ between individuals with their level of experience. And that was something that I found with this research. I tried to do a wide range of participants. So I went from someone who's coached for 20 plus years to someone who's only been coaching for one year and has come from teach, uh, coaching juniors and possibly under 16s to now coaching adults. And it gave me a really good perspective. Uh, so as you can see on the methods, so I use semi-structured interviews and a checklist that was adapted from research that allowed me to very clearly see from the transcripts of the interviews what coaches were doing in their sessions. And it actually was really nice to see a wide range of coaches having very similar experiences. So as you can see from the bar chart at the top of the page, I'm not sure if the post has come up yet, um, that um, small modified games was a really big theme that came from all six interviews. Um, the main one was using small modified games in their warmups that allowed the people that they were coaching, so from 18 upwards, to be able to create that link for the session because all the coaches highlighted the same point that if there's not a nice flow to the warm up and for the session, then the adults aren't going to have an understanding of those skills. And I think that was really nice to see that you have some coaches that are coaching adults still creating that like secondary school link with their sessions, making sure that there is a connection and the skills of being taught are relevant to those people. Um, fitness was really important as well. Fitness in netball is really important. I think it's the nature of the game. You've got to make sure that your fitness is up there to play for 60 minutes. Um, but the use of some small modified games, because my dissertation and my research was conducted once the pandemic hit, um, netball was allowed to continue, but had to follow very strict roadmaps and very strict outlines of what was allowed to happen in training and what wasn't. So it meant that training had to be modified. So not only skills were being learned, but also they were being learned in an environment that was relevant to the games that could have been played at that time. Um, by applying the small modified games and TGFU approach to their warm up, um, allowed the coach to combine elements of the whole netball game in general. So it wasn't just really focusing on their fitness or getting their heart rate up like a basic warm up. It was making sure that everything was relevant. Um, so, so with the TGFU, coaches like teachers act as facilitators. And that is the most applied way that the coaches told me during the interview. So when I was looking at back on some of the transcripts, it was making sure that they were being the facilitator. They weren't giving all the answers they were letting everyone else go off and try their own thing. Um, and it was nice to see that there was a shift away from the basic skill drilled approach. So people weren't less active, which was linking to their fitness. So if they were standing around during a drill, it wouldn't be relevant and wouldn't be beneficial to their fitness levels. Uh, enjoyment levels and interest levels were maintained due to decision-making application of the skill 
linked heavily to the game. So the adults were able to create the links themselves, not being given everything by the coaches. Um, if I was to do this again in the future, I think the main thing for me would be now COVID is less of an impact looking at has coaching approaches adjusted or has it still maintained the same from COVID and possibly looking at different age groups and maybe moving into a school setting as well would be nice to see. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kenzie. And I, I'll just say that again, I apologize with the technical difficulties, but I think we, when we've come through a pandemic and we've had as many Zooms and webinars as I'm sure most of us have um, as attendees, you can appreciate that. But as, as my colleagues Sarah said, uh, Kenzie's presentation, which is excellent, I've seen it, we will be able to share that through. I did try to override you, Kenzie. And oh no, it's, it's not working, is it? <laughs> But I, I also um, very much value that you, you're very in-depth, very close to your research. So anybody um, will have really got a really lovely picture of the content you've looked at. So I do apologise on that. Are there any questions for Kenzie? At the moment, I've noticed in the sort of question and answer, uh, Jamie and Laura are currently... Uh, replying back to you as fast as they can uh, so please bear with us on that one um, but is there anything for Kenzie at this moment in time? I feel like I can I can ask Kenzie a question Andy, Kenzie I know <laughs> we've completed this research and it's something that you know very close to both of us in in our area and yeah. now you know you're out in that that world of practitioner um, you know development in, in PE teaching and I know you're coaching also can you looking back on your project, what what would you do differently, or what things can you would you if you do it again, would you advise us, us ourselves as practitioners to think about? Um, I think the main one would be I would like to go more into a school setting as well, just to sort of see this approach applied in that sort of sense. I think looking at adults, a lot of coaches are very stuck in their ways with coaching adults, and it is a lot of drill based to get the idea across. Um, but when I'm looking into a school setting, it'd be nice, obviously being a PE teacher now and being in my first year of, um, as an ECT, it's nice to actually see that uh, TGFU approach coming into lessons. So I'm currently teaching year seven netball. So it's actually quite nice to be able to apply like a TGFU approach and see the difference compared to a drill based class. And it's the learning levels are drastic between the two at the moment, which I've noticed. So and anything uh different i would say i'd like to try and maybe get a wider range of coaches so i only interviewed six females so i would have maybe have liked to get possibly a male viewpoint but because of the pandemic a lot of people did stop the coaching so it was pretty difficult thank you for that kenzie uh, there is a question in the uh, q a uh, from sophie frost uh, why do you think the way coaches are training their players have changed after the pandemic? Did you get that, Kenzie? Have we lost her? We lost her, oh dear. Sophie? Um, hopefully if we can get Kenzie back she'll answer the question and type it in the chat for you um, apologies on that one uh, well, we'll move on and think if there's any more or we'll move on to the final presentation whatever you feel Alan thank you uh, so there's no other sort of questions that I can see for now if anyone does have anything please do continue to put it in the question and answer section um, so then it's my job to uh, present our final presentation. Um, so this is presented by Maeve. We have a case study research undertaken by Emily Duckett, who is a graduate from the PESYD degree and is currently a PE teacher and is unable to present this evening due to a school event. Her research focused on her publication work, which explored games, knowledge, sharing within a PE department. So over to you, Maeve. Thank you so much. And I just want to reiterate, I am not even a close second to Emily Duckett, who um, would have been a fantastic presenter of our, our published research in this area. But I'll, I'll try my best to do her justice. 
So what I'll present this afternoon or this evening, uh, depending on where we are, is this knowledge sharing in games theory. And, and what we are, and just to highlight, is one of our, our research areas where we looked and focused on a P department in particular, and we looked at knowledge sharing in that area. So that's just a little highlight of some of the work. So where we are at the moment, um, I said, uh, sorry, Emily is a graduate from our physical education sport needs development degree and is currently teaching um, on her background. So her research project really focused on can insight into personal factors um, affect the knowledge and understanding physical ed education teachers have of the TGFU um, game centered approach and further encourage them to share knowledge. So where did this really come from in this research area is that we find through our, our literature review and our review of that research landscape that it is an area that's really focused in education and really that TGFU and Game Centre approach is really important in those areas in, in PE teaching in particular. We find key research by Rossi et al and Diaz Kyoto et al to identify PE teachers, however, are somewhat maybe potentially nervous or reluctant to implement uh, GCA or Game Centre approaches into their teaching. And then also, likewise, we find in that research that multiple studies also find that PE teacher potential potentially also lack this pedagogical context knowledge on games approaches. So that's really where our introduction was and where we came through with that content. We further also find through, you know, some of the research by Harvey and Phil also looked at the imbalance potential between males and, and females and their interest around games approaches. But their finding on this was not really conclusive. So the current literature in GCA suggests that teachers can really boost their games knowledge by knowledge sharing and this educational community and the CPD. However, the current field of games literature really fails to look at those factors and why there's gaps in these knowledge. So, and this is the area why we, we decided to undertake this study. So the aims of this study in particular were really to investigate these personal factors that affect PE teacher knowledge in this area. And really our purpose was then to how this knowledge is really shared across a, a PE um, department in the that area. So really what the, the study looked at, it had a, a qualitative methodology and it sampled seven qualified PE teachers um, an age range between 26 to 40 years of age. The breakdown of that sample was three female PE teachers and four male PE teachers. So really structured um, and balanced in that way. To better understand the participants, we felt it was really important to first use an information collection questionnaire. And from that, it allowed us to really understand about some of the gender specialized sports, the self-rated knowledge that our participants really had in um, this pedagogical, pedagogical content knowledge. These results also then helped us in our interview process. Um, we then obviously through our semi-structured interviews were able to gain and develop that understanding of our, um, of our teachers and what is happening. Um, in that way, the research was formed around manual thematic analysis and that was used to analyze interview content and then inductively suggest some key areas of interest. So, the strength of that real methodology that we find was that it was rigorous um, and it's again likewise to other similar as we've spoke before about similar methods used in in this research area um, like Rossi et al and Wang and Ha. We also find that we felt it was both more trustworthy in how we did that using a triangulation of that data. For example, the as Kyoto et al used multiple qualitative methods similar to this and, and that's why we sort of framed in that way. So Going back to the results in the discussion, what we really find were five key, there, key areas you can see in our, our aspect here. So the first real area was the views across the department. And what we found is that all of the teachers that we sampled um, used a whole part, whole method. And they also combined this with sport education and they use it in combination with game centered approaches, which we find is really interesting um, because it shows that they all have this baseline knowledge um, and provide really a good comprehensive games curriculum. The second area in there in the end as well is this impact of the teacher specialist sport. And we find that was really something of interest um, for our research area. And what we find was that what our teachers or a sample did outside of their um, their teaching day um, and their sports specialism actually impacted where they um, delivered that games um, centered approaches in TGFU. 
Um, in particular, you can see the range of different sports that were specialists to our teachers. And what we also find there were some individual sports that actually had um, related that we found in our research to um, a reduced lack or you know, reduced knowledge of TGFU and GCE. Um, the difference among the sports or the games that we find through interview and through analysis of that, that the sports such as rugby and football actually promoted the approach. So our teachers found that external to their PE teaching um, training, their sports actually supplemented that. And they find that far more, we find that more in our, our rugby and football specialisms compared to um, somebody who had a, a background in netball. So we find this maybe suggests that some teachers with individual sport or netball specialism could have impacted knowledge levels in that way. Our third level um, or third um, aspect that we really looked at was this accumulation of current knowledge. So the key find in this area was again where our teachers had come through and where their prior knowledge and their degree courses actually prepared them to deliver a games centered approach curriculum. Um, and what we find is the key difference is, is an undergrad or degree level content on GCA. And where we find through those exploration um, and what Emily found particularly interesting is that some, um, there's more emphasis in some of our, depending on where we're coming through through our teaching degrees, um, some emphasis is more um, on game centre approaches than others. Um, and key was that once you had our, our sample who had less education in games, actually in our in our questionnaire read themselves as less confident in those areas and um, which we again established that um, as that really interesting finding the fourth area we had a demonstration of not demonstration of knowledge and an understanding that area our findings showed a small gender difference and um, we had as you said a mix of male and female teachers we found that two of our female teachers showed less confidence and knowledge um, and similar to, to Harvey and Pill's research in this area, although it's not conclusive, so it's a small study scale, but it's interesting that we find that even at the small study scale. Similar to this, the second sort of found in this, this area is that more knowledge of games um, came from their teaching experience or from the education that they've undertaken, um, and that meant that they were more con uh, confident in that area too, so sort of a hand-in-hand -hand approach. And then obviously that we find as well is this higher, you know, reported confidence levels in that area. And we find that our teachers were more comfortable to teach games in the curriculum because they were had that confidence compared to those that were less confident, did not feel confident um, to do that. We've gone to our final area um, and suggested for knowledge development. That was something we we're really key to know what our teachers find would, would support their, their area and um, their knowledge in this area. And suggested um, some suggested sharing across the department um, and some sort of felt that creating resources to guide lesson planning um, of games would, would really support those who have less confident and confident in that area. Um, one of our teachers in particular suggested working with expert coaches in the area and taking tips for their, from their sports external to their um, PE experience would, would also support that. Um, Potentially this could happen. It's just a very underexplored area, but we, we find, find that as, a, as an interesting point. However, what really shone through, which is concerning, is the real lack of PCPD in this area. Um, and what they felt is our teachers that the, the CPD or insufficient CPD, um, which is also similarly discussed by Keegan in 2019, showed that there were some sort of you know, challenges there for our teachers currently in the educational sector. So moving on and finally to our conclusions in this. Um, so we felt that our PE teachers um, with the special sport or maybe their undergraduate training um, really impacted their knowledge and how they felt confident and competent to deliver TGFU and GCA. We found that those who had more experienced game teaching um, improved their teacher confidence in that area. We also found that those who improved confidence also um, led the teachers to utilize these approaches across the curriculum. And again, that obviously developed the more experience that there were. We also found that it was really interesting that the valuable games resources and knowledge sharing can come from simply working closely with your department and um, with your, your teachers within that. And the progress can come from knowledge and confidence, even external to the PE department and what is offered in CPD in the moment. Moving on to further research, so some studies could really investigate the several diverse dips and, and use of multiple research methods and really explore this topic further. 
it also could look at some more into that gender differences um, and maybe look at why this may be a key factor within the PE experiences. This is potentially an area for future research. And finally, it really would be beneficial to maybe scrutinize and really to improve or understand the PCPD that is out there for our teachers um, that want to really improve their knowledge in CAA. So that's really us for now. I welcome any questions on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maeve. That's a very interesting presentation. And thank you for presenting it on behalf of Emily this evening. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through. So from Nicholas Lomas, why do you think football and rugby specialists have a higher promotion compared to the netball ones, for example? Thank you for that question. It's a really interesting question, given that my background is in Nepal. So I very much identify with what we, we find just in, in our study as well. But yeah, what we find, um, and again, the study was based in the south of England, um, working in the, the UK um, curriculum, the English curriculum. Um, and what we found with these particular, these particular teachers were working externally, coaching, working in their local communities. And um, potentially what that may be is that the better setup that certain covenant bodies have, namely, as we said, rugby or football compared to other sports, maybe as well due to their um, the opportunities provided for coaching CPD um, in those particular governing body um, areas. And that's certainly something to consider where how do we how do we get our CPD? I, I know myself personally taught for a number of years. I would jump on a lot of that CPT opportunities provided by different governing bodies. So I think that's a key indicator is those type of those sports and the governing body promotion of that and how we are, are using that knowledge to really transcend into, um, into our practices. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Um, another question has come through from Jacob Law. Uh, would you be able to comment on the impact of QTT and mentoring on the use and uptake of GC? Lovely question. Thank you so much, Jacob. Jacob is a, a good colleague of ours, so very valuable um, to think about this in our way. And I think, again, as a lecturer in, in physical education um, myself and also in sports coaching, I think it is important that we foster experiences for our students. Um, and as you, you will have seen there this evening from our, our very talented and very um, motivated area, you know, practitioners in this area, how we are allowing them to access that content. And obviously through mentoring, through our own good practice and, and how we're taking on that CPT and the new approaches, I know Laura spoke about that earlier, how we're again, we're upskilling ourselves and allowing at undergraduate level and also in that NQT area, allowing them to have a very safe space um, to, to develop those skills. Um, and in, in doing that, mentoring them um, as, as potential, you know, to develop this as an area um, to support meaningful experiences of physical education for, for our young people. Thank you. Um, a question from Alison Murray. Uh, I think it's uh, going to be a few ones here, so I'm going to just take my time reading it out to you. So in your research, does the perceived confidence have any perceived impact upon competence embracing the game's approaches? Mm -hmm. um, she says super ways to share practice how might sustainable CPD look as in for schools without having to buy in um, she's a primary school factor consideration there and what are your gathered sort of secret insights a couple of parts to that one we'll that one so I might try and see if I can get to the, the I, I did have it, the first part and um, Perceived confidence. So yeah, we, we work a lot with the perceived confidence and, the, and actually the what's translated into practice. So what, again, on a small scale study, what we find was what we self rate or what the, the teacher self rated in their confidence. And um, it looked to be that those who rated on a, on a lower level, they're actually then also found um, and, and said they wouldn't have been confident or, you know, would have found it a challenge to try and go firsthand and deliver this practice. So again, does the perceived confidence have a perceived impact? Yeah, because in that way, they feel that some of our teachers felt that they weren't experts in this field. And some of that was back to, you know, the previous question about the, um, you know, how they're developed as teachers. Are we allowing them to expose exposure to these practices to really develop that pedagogical contact knowledge prior to 
having 30 kids in front of us for a lesson. So I think that definitely um, was an impact. Um, how am I sustainable to DPD? Absolutely. I know what it's like running a department and very little time and very little funding to do that. I think we're, we are super, we have one this evening, webinars, um, are a great way to connect some of those things where we can network really well um, and some of the parts of where our practitioners and some of our teachers in the study would love to have had time to read the research be up to date with that um, and so we could knowledge share among our communities of practice whether that be within our networks between primaries and secondary schools between our networks again even extended to our governing bodies and how we can work really closely with those educational authorities to do that and um, so I so Secret insights. I think I, the more the more that we knowledge share and the more that we work within our department, if we're given time from senior management within our departments um, to look at that and work on that, that, that's only going to be a benefit. So secret insight would have been as, as a head of department myself in the secondary school for a number of years, having that time, you know, twilight sessions or, or days to actually look at this and use that as a real tool to knowledge share with our teachers, which we had another aspect of study was teachers who were newly qualified and those with a lot more experience, how we're really um, filtering down that knowledge because really, really, really good practice out there, but how are we sharing that among our team? Hopefully I've answered that okay, Alison. Quite a few there, I hope that did get answered. Um, I think Tom has had a question in the Q&A and I think it's an excellent one to sort of end on. This is sort of addressing everybody who's spoken this evening. Um, so is a TGFU games based approach, game centered approach, the best approach for all levels of performers? So considering novices to experts with a complete novice, is there an argument for focusing just on the skill execution to scaffold learning? So could we have some input from the speakers this evening? Thank you very much. They've all left me now. They've all turned off their cameras, but I'll start. Thank you so much, Tom, um, for that question. And, and thank you again for the very positive comments um, for, for all of us here. I probably will go first and, and to say from, from my personal um, opinion, I think there is an argument to where, where we again look, and I, I know Laura mentioned that earlier, the holistic approach to how we are impacting our, and, and delivering our pedagogy for, for our young people that we're working with. So there probably is that, that argument for focus on skill acquisition to scaffold learning. So I know we have previous research out there um, from a number of studies who have said sometimes it's very challenging the pay environment and sometimes challenging in depending on the coaching level that you're on to try and use these approaches because they are not fitting the learner and where they are in their stage um, of there. So again, there has to be that foundational knowledge. Um, and again, part of that is their skill acquisition. Have they already got that um, level to, to appropriately then move it into a games area? And I know myself moving completely into that um, can be very challenging as a teacher or coach depending on that. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues want to add on to that, Jamie or Laura want to add on. Sorry, was oh, oh, sorry, was this the question in the chat? Sorry, I've just been typing the whole time for Tom. So it's um, really does um, will a complete not with a complete novice is there an argument for focusing on just skill of in um, skill ex execution to scaffold learning? I want to add on? All oh, right, let me have a moment to can I have a moment to think about it. I'll let you have a moment to go. Thank you, Jamie. I'll, I'll come in while you're thinking about it then. Um, I, 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 like I think Maeve's already alluded to, I think you, you need that you need that, that physical foundation there uh, to be able to grow, but there's no there's no reason why you can't bring other holistic other holistic elements within into, into that skill execution and question um, you know and again you can use questioning, but question question what they're doing, why are they doing it um, and, and that and that's, I think, probably the key takeaway message from from the game centered approach tonight is that is that we, when we're when we're teaching through that approach, we are trying to develop students not just physically, co cognitively, uh, and also effectively as well. So, yeah, Laura. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Jamie, for jumping in. Um, yeah, I think so too. And it's um, it's definitely about 
evaluating your students and um sort of modifying it to their needs and we've me and Dell actually have uh gone back and forth chatting um about sort of even taking the the metacognitive approach and not actually focusing on a specific sport and just taking fundamental movement skills and developing it that way so just simplifying those things then obviously build onto that where you can then more and more implement other approaches such as TGVU, etc um when they grow a little bit older um but i do think it's important to build that foundation as well yeah but these approaches are, are just great and just get rid of that queuing and it very instructional type of teaching which is obviously very old-fashioned um so yeah thank you very much i didn't want to jump on top of there um, to say um but i think that was the question so far um i've lost you now so hope it's okay so just just really to to finish um and off today and i i just on, on behalf of st mary's university in, in twickenham in london i want to say first and foremost just to thank you to our attendees we had uh, a registration last kind yesterday of, of nearly 400 um, interested parties in that area from, from worldwide. So for that, it gives us great, great confidence in the work that we are doing. And I'm perceptionally very, very proud who work very closely with our pres um, presenters this evening. So I want to say thank you to our attendees who stayed with us for the hour. We really appreciate that. I'd also like to thank Ellen personally um, and the TGFU SIG for their support and ongoing support of our work um, in this area and our research. Obviously, we, we do a lot of um, theory and knowledge in this um, through our programs. And we're passionate about developing that even further and, and, and using that. Um, I also would like to say um, a thank you as well to my colleague, Sarah Daniels. You'll see her previously typing in the text who's kept me sane and uh, my heart rate quite low. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to Ellen, who's just going to give some information um, to finalise what has happened and what's going to happen afterwards. Thank you very much. And I would like to express my gratitude to the presenters this evening um, for being here tonight and showcasing their work. So thank you all for making it a very interesting webinar this evening. Um, for those of you who are interested in our upcoming webinars, uh, we've got a few more uh, of our International Advisory Board uh, professional development webinars. We also have some more upcoming ones. Uh, we are going to be doing a discussion on the Inventing Games model uh, about teacher reflection, and we're also going to do some work on assessing and learning. We also have announcing this evening, um, a special announcement, that we will have a 40th anniversary conference. Uh, this will be a live one day event on the 28th of January. Uh, during this event, we will have uh, live keynotes, we will have special guest um, presenters. Um, if you would like to submit an abstract, these will be pre-recorded presentations and available for an entire year um, through the registration. The information regarding the call for abstracts will likely go out tomorrow and the registration will open on Monday. So please do join us. All the information will be on our website and Twitter over the next couple of days. So hopefully you can join us there. Uh, beyond that, it is a big thank you from me and the TGFU SIG this evening. Um, so thank you very much.